Hi, my name is Katie. I'm 27. I'm originally from Southern California and I'm currently um, in Massachusetts on the East Coast. Dear little Katie, I love you. You are bright and thoughtful and so open to the world. And you want to love the people around you so hard and be loved by them so hard back. I don't have the right words for you. I know you are already feeling the responsibility of your parents' happiness. You feel the weight of dreams you've never dreamt and expectations not even yet communicated to you. You see your parents' sadness through their joy. You see the pain and loss that ultimately resulted in you, their daughter. You know that you have a role to play and you're trying so hard to do it. I see you, I see you trying, but your fear gets in the way. You're afraid of something only your body remembers now. I know the woman who gave birth to us now, but I still don't know what to call her. I know that when she was pregnant with us, it wasn't easy. I know that while she was carrying us in her belly, she was also carrying the grief of losing her own mom. I think we may have soaked up a little of that sadness. I know she tried to numb her pain, but that only worked for us until we came out into the world. Then we felt everything and it hurt. And the only other person who understood the sadness and the withdrawals we inherited was gone. I know all of this is too much for you to understand right now, but I also know that you still feel everything. I know you're still afraid of something you can't name. If someone asked you right now what your biggest fears are, you would say lions and poison ivy. These fears you can name and people understand them even if they try to convince you that California isn't home to any wild lions or poison ivy. But when you're afraid to close your eyes and fall asleep at night, it's not the thought of accidentally traipsing through a field of poison ivy that keeps you up. It's everything you've felt since you came into this world, the pain and the aloneness, the things your parent's daughter doesn't feel. You don't have the words, so you beg to stay up for five more minutes. And when that extra five minutes is up, they tuck you in, give you a glass of water, and tell you that they love you. You say it back, and you feel loved. But then they close the door, and you're alone again, just like the first time. So you try to open the door to reestablish your connection to the rest of the world, to not feel so alone. But you've done this before many times before, so the door is locked. So you sit there crying for your parents and trying to peer through the narrow gap between the carpet and the door, searching for anything that will make you feel less alone. When that's not enough, you hit the door with all the strength in your five-year-old fists. You bang on the door until your hands are red and raw, but the fear is worse than the soreness. So you switch back to your feet and kick until they too are red and raw. You've always been resourceful. You are so afraid of being bad and getting in trouble, but this other fear is worse. The thing is, little Katie, I don't remember what happens next. I don't know if they opened up the door or we just exhausted ourselves until our little body fell asleep against our will. What I do remember is that this is not one of the kinds of fears the grown-ups understand, not like lions or the dark. Even if you don't have the right words, you show them what you are afraid of. It's not your fault that they don't see. Their eyes are trained to see something else. Their daughter is just curious and precocious. They say, we just don't wanna miss out on what's going on. They call us a night owl. This is the way they can understand your fear. So you go along with it, play the role, so you can feel safe, not knowing that this sense of security is temporary. You learn to talk sweetly and negotiate, and sometimes this is charming enough to work, even when they really want you to go to bed. It won't stay charming for long, though. There's nothing charming about losing yourself in someone else's idea of who you should be, who they need you to be for the sake of their own sense of self but we're finding ourselves. We're finding the words we need and naming the fears we couldn't name before. I love you and I see you. Thank you. Unshrouding the shame.
I am not the mistakes that I have made. I am not a mistake. I am not something that needs to be hidden away because I make people uncomfortable. Why does this idea cut to the core of who I am? Why are we in a world where my mother needed a contract with a man to legitimize me? Why does the woman suffer? I want to believe that I am light, but the stories of my life are lies because I was the lie living it. My name is a lie, an actor playing a part in someone else's family. Did everything that happened to me before I came out of the fog really happen? Now that I've seen my face reflected in my father, I recognize myself. For the first time in 50 years, I can see my own face. As I heal, I feel real. And I wonder if anything before now is real. And I'm ready to remove the shroud of shame that was placed on my shoulders at birth. Hi, my name is Gabriel and I'm a transracial adoptee. And this piece that I wrote is untitled. My story has become a cover that I use to project the nice and palatable things, the things that others can stomach to hear. It's become pure entertainment where I take the listeners through the winding peaks and valleys of adoption while avoiding talking about the deep caverns and canyons that have violently torn me apart. The more exciting that I make it, the less they will show me pity or feel bad for me. I can do it in German, in Hebrew, and Yiddish, but if that's not enough for them, then I can do tricks as I recap the tale, maybe a handstand or dancing a waltz. I wrap it in laughter and tie it in a pretty bow. I want them to be entertained and distracted so that they don't notice that there is a crying baby who doesn't understand the legal system or what an adoptive parent even is. That there is a baby inside of me that has forgotten how to breathe because my mom is dead and I got all of my oxygen from her. That there is a baby who is wondering if they even exist because there are so few people who can attest to their birth. That this baby grew up into an adult who is perpetually lost because my five senses were developed and curated in an environment that I no longer have access to. It feels like I'm a child lost in a store without being able to locate my parents. I begin to panic, but I can't remember what they looked sounded, smelled, or felt like. I can't remember what they were wearing or even what their names were because I thought their names were just mom and dad. Mixed in the panic is the insidious shame. If you hadn't let go of the shopping cart, if you hadn't wandered off, if you hadn't been bad, if you hadn't been bad, if you hadn't been bad, then you would not be separated. Another part fights back against the shame. Had I known, it says what life would be like now, then I would have fought and fought and fought like hell. I would have held that umbilical cord for dear life. I would have emerged into this world screaming, don't choose to give me up. Don't choose for our beginning to be our ending. Don't choose for our first hello to really be our last goodbye. Choose me, choose me, choose me. As an adult, I no longer beg or cry for love or attention or caring. My mouth and lips can no longer form the word choose me to others because the requests have always felt like they will be met with a no, and I can only die from heartbreak so many times. No one teaches babies to handle heartbreak and losing their first loves. So I don't expect people to choose me or to stick around, even though that baby in me hasn't stopped crying and is still just waiting. None of this I say because others don't speak baby. So I translate and transfigure it into something more palatable. People don't like stories that are more dark than a Greek tragedy. So I make my story into a farce, wrapped in laughter and absurdity, that is as easy to swallow as a chewable multivitamin. Hi, my name is Tawny Johnston. I was born in 1958, relinquished then, and adopted three days later. Um, This is my attempt to put into words something that I go through that's hard. My half-brother, Charles, who lives across the country, texts with me on WhatsApp a few times a month. WhatsApp messages don't show up on his mother's phone bill, which is a good thing. 
because she believes adoptees are trouble so much that she prevents her partner, my biological dad, from having any relationship with me. A genealogist, no less, she acknowledges I'm related to her sons, but we're all supposed to pretend my father doesn't know I exist. He goes along with this charade, even though he stole away to meet me once. They and another brother, Charles's identical twin, all, all live together. Once in a while, Charles texts me a photo from our dad. Once in a blue moon, this biological parent of mine mails me a letter. A letter that makes me feel so at home and so comforted that I deeply crave more. Kind of like dark chocolate covered almonds, which I can't keep in the house. This longing for more builds with every trip to the mailbox, the quarter mile country walk. Even the peaceful sea at one side and the deep horse pasture on the other can't calm me. My mind won't be distracted. My heart seals itself against the empty sadness about to hit. This senseless scenario plays out daily for months. I finally admit the problem and make a pact with my husband to relieve me from male duty. I hand off the key to the box. As time goes on, the photos and mailings stop altogether, but nothing really quiets me from wanting them until Easter. Yes, I prefer a dark chocolate bunny. A birthday card and small present I'd sent to Dad's secret P.O. box the month before had gone unanswered this year. How could it be, I wonder? I had measured every word, every action. With no better answer in the end, I join in the silence. I plan to just, just leave him alone from now on. Then I hear a YouTube recording during Holy Week with contemplative, high, and stunningly pure voices that instantly registers as something my classical music-loving bio-dad, who'd been raised Catholic, would love. After a deep breath or two, I text Charles to please share it with him, adding a simple, hope he has a happy Easter. My mind goes on overdrive, certain this amazing performance will bring real joy and at least a greeting from my bio dad, but nothing comes. The next week, as part of a light text with Charles, I add that our dad's response reminds me of John Cage's piece from the 50s called Four Minutes, 33 Seconds. Ha ha. Then another thought hits me. In the piece 433, the instrumentalist stays silent for four minutes and 33 seconds, highlighting for the audience what's going on in the environment rather than any music coming from the stage. Listeners are forced to turn their attention to things usually unnoticed, like a bus passing by outside or the shuffle of someone's shoe. Could it be like the composer who expected that trading music for background sounds would be good for his audiences, that my biological and adoptive parents thought quietly swapping themselves for each other would be a fine experience for everyone? John Cage fulfilled his desire to be seen as modern with this, his most famous piece. The adults involved in my adoption chose sealed secrets as their preference, which is the way it continued to be carried out for decades to come. I just demand to know, why is it taking so long to matter when everyone is agreeing that they know what is right and true and best for everyone else, that it's the adoptee who stands at the center of this equation? I'm not here alone. For that, I'm grateful. I'm so much richer for my fellow adoptees, the expressions shared through talking and writings, but also through drawings, songs, and poetry give me solace and hope. Alongside them, I can't expect to trade away my sadness or fill the empty hole inside, but together I can look towards a better future. Down the road from my house, the new updated cluster mailbox is in. The model is the same size and shape, but more secure, less able to be vandalized than the last. And I wonder, can I keep my sense of self and hold the new key? I really hope so. I'm just not sure how long I can keep trying. Adoptee and Healing, Chapter One. 
Hear now the voice of one American adoptee who spent a lifetime searching for my identity. It took 45 years to find my first family. After failing through court petitions, private eyes and the adoption registry. My original birth certificate, which had been denied to me, was unsealed after 25 years of advocate lobbying. It took decades to convince legislators that sealed records is a travesty and to explain the devastation of being a biological amputee. Why do we have to fight for the human right of knowing how we came to be? Our first chapter should be available for each of us to read. Yet the story is the same across generation and geography and the people that hold the power continue committing the same atrocity. They demonstrate a lack of integrity, humility and humanity by suggesting it doesn't matter if one has their family medical history or the resemblance and genetic mirrors that reflect our origin, culture, and ancestry. There are too many forces in place to protect the system they choose to see. When will we stop denying adoptees their legitimacy and breaking through the pervasive and intoxicating fantasy that we somehow exist in perpetual infancy when the truth is a much more sobering reality. Too many lives lost to addiction, suicide, and other tragedy as we navigate through the disenfranchised, unprocessed, soul-crushing grief. For those of us that survive this complexity, we bear the scars from so much trauma caused developmentally. This journey has led to an epiphany that I must change the system that forever altered me. I am committed to healing multi-generationally, restoring wholeness to mothers, fathers, brothers, and sisters collectively. To my adoption, the reunions portrayed on TV do not reflect reality. For decades, we have seen reunions on TV, daytime talk shows, talk shows such as Phil Donahue, Sally Jesse Raphael, and of course, Oprah. These touching, precious moments showing an adoptee and a birth first mother meeting in person as adults for the first time are very moving. These tear jerking moments are designed to hook the audience in. These Kleenex moments are very powerful. The anticipation of adoptees meeting the parent or parents that created them and brought the adoptees into this world is heartfelt and uplifting. However, these rating grabbing moments are just the tip of the emotional iceberg in reunions. These good feeling moments and stories that society craves to see only shows the beginning of the adoption reunion journeys. When the lights and cameras are turned off, the audiences go home or the final editing of the shows or reunion series are cut, society does not get to see what comes next for these adoption reunion journeys. Society does not get to see publicly the remaining stages of reunion. The public does not get to see where either or both parties, the adoptees or the birth first parents begin to pull back. The public does not get to see the emotional upheaval that happens when, re when reunions have been frozen for years or decades begin to surface to our consciousness. Fear, doubt, anger, guilt, shame and rage begin to show their ugly heads. Eventually, Drama, chaos, projection, and second rejections begin to occur. And the once beautiful and heart-touching reunion becomes shattered dreams. The effects of trauma and the primal wound 
introduced by Nancy Berrier, take over. Hearts, dreams, and hopes are dashed and shattered all over again. If and likely when this happens, the adoptees and birth first parents are left trying to pick up the pieces of their lives once again. I believe it is possible that adoption reunions are sal salvageable. I believe for this to happen, both the adoptees and the birth first parents need to be willing to put in the time and effort to work on themselves. I tried in my reunion to work on myself with the hopes that I could fix the re issues between my birth first mother and I. I went to therapy for 10 of the first 20 years of my reunion. My birth first mother did not go to therapy for her issues around relinquishment and adoption. Eventually, after 20 years into our reunion, I began to make the decision to walk away. I walked away from my own sanity. I walked away to preserve my serenity. I walked away to care for myself and for my marriage. Sometimes I wish my reunion had turned out like the Hallmark moments I grew up watching on TV. But that would be another lie, wouldn't it? And I, for one, am tired of the lies. So here I am, this wonderful opportunity, a chance to be heard and perhaps understood. As I stand here though, I crumble in a loss for words. It's an unsurmountable task to convey 61 years of pain, sorrow, and grief into two minutes. Today's my birthday. I chose to work though, so I don't have to be left alone with the trauma my body remembers of that day. So I was leaving work, the question was raised. What are you gonna to do tonight? Not thinking or hesitating, I blurted out, I'm going straight home and locking the door so no harm will come to me. Listen to that statement. I'm going straight home and locking the door so no harm will come to me. Happy birthday. Mother delivers a baby. The baby's me. The mother's mine. Her identity I will never know. Her embrace I will never feel. Her love I will never have. With my first breath, I am taught these valuable lessons. Everything is a lie. Everyone will abandon me. I will never know who I am. As I was whisked away to be forgotten, abandoned, and deemed illegitimate, my survival instincts kicked in and I'm crying and screaming. Please hold me, please love me, please don't let me go, please don't take me away, please don't do this. No one, no one is listening to me. I laid still, I fall silent. So here I am with this wonderful opportunity, a chance to be heard, perhaps understood, but what if I make too much noise? What if I ask for too much? What if I make others uncomfortable? What if I say the wrong thing? What if you don't love me? The consequences are high. Danger is imminent. Why does everyone get to make decisions that create loss and pain and abandonment in my life? Why do they leave? Why am I not enough? Or why am I too much? Why can't someone take care of me? I just want to be loved and taken care of for who I am, although I'm not even sure who that is. I've played so many roles in my life, which looking back feels like a goal on my part to make sure that I was the right thing someone would want so they wouldn't leave. The interesting part to me is that I have people who haven't left, who have been there for me and have continued to stay, who want to stay, who choose to stay. Why weren't they enough to fill that hole? I know everyone involved at the time of my relinquishment thought it would be enough, but it couldn't be. She left me with strangers good people who have done all they can to create safety and love for me throughout my life. But it didn't matter. There is nothing they could have done to fill the hole that was left when she left. I would always have a gaping hole that I would spend my life trying to fix or fill with something or someone. Looking back, I realized the hole was there 
and all the attempts I made at putting a Band-Aid on it were futile. I didn't realize how big and how vast and what it would really take to fill that hole until I realized and could actually name it. It's abandonment, the biggest, deepest abandonment hole. I was left and given to strangers. I wasn't wanted, I wasn't enough, I was too much. And while these stories may not be her truth, they became my truth and the stories I continued to tell myself throughout my life. So I pretend, I pretend to be whoever they want me to be so that they won't leave, but they do. And the hole gets so big that not even a tourniquet will stop the bleeding. And sometimes when someone abandons me, I think I will die. How could the wound be so deep and so vast that I could die? Maybe someone could just amputate where the tourniquet is and make it stop. Most days I just want it to stop. But I am learning to heal the wound, to not just put a Band-Aid on it, but to mend and to give it time and to acknowledge that what I feel is real and okay and not wrong, that there is not something fundamentally wrong with me and that I am enough. And then maybe someday I'll believe it. All right, and I'm beginning. I am still here. I'm an adoptee and I'm still here. To all those that bullied me in elementary and high school, I am still here. To those adults that said I would accumulate to nothing in life, I am still here. To those that made fun of how effeminate or flamboyant I was, I'm still here. To those that made fun of me due to my weight or told me I was ugly growing up, I am still here. To those adults that make me feel ugly or less worthy, I am still here. To the authority figures that continue to oppress me for being a part of the queer community, I am still here. To the ex-boyfriends who treated me badly, I am still here. To my mom who worried about my safety growing up, don't worry, Ma, I am still here. Hear me roar as I move forward within this world, spreading light and love. Listen to me sing songs of new beginnings and bliss, embracing in the sunshine after having endured endless thunderstorms. Feel the ground vibrate as I dance towards joy and silliness, embracing all of who I was meant to be, not who I was told to be. Taste the sweet justice of those who have been oppressed due to an identity. Hold hands and stand taller together, outnumbering those oppressors. Smell the smells of freedom as I guide and care for others who have been knocked down or harmed, reminding them that they are worthy, loved, and cared for. You tried to knock me down. Well, it worked. But what you didn't expect is that I kept getting back up, that I would continue to get back up, blow after blow, heartache after heartache, gaining more and more strength with each experience to finally walk away from your grip you, hold, you held around my happiness. You didn't expect me to move mountains and seas as I fight for the equality and justice for all who deserve a voice, those who don't have a voice. You may have tried to break my spirit along the way, and although I cracked here and there, I never shattered. What shattered was your control, your toxicity that was like a spell I was mesmerized under. I no longer grant you power over me. I am still here, and I don't plan on going anywhere anytime soon. <laughs>